treatment of high glucose level, including disorder in lipid metabolism, carbohydrate and fat metabolism. And we have also uh, seen uh, like uh, the different types of uh, DM, like the type one, type two, and gestational, and other classes we didn't mention, it is not very, uh, very common. But they are actually categorized other types of DM, like due to medication and due to other conditions, and even maturity also uh, DM in youngs. But that one is not something we're going to worry about because this is very rare circumstances. So uh, the most likely type of DM you can get uh, is like type one, type two, and uh, gestational DM. So uh, before we go in detail uh, about, uh, uh, we have also seen even like the different, uh, uh, the pathogenesis of DM a bit. But today we'll see about the physiological effect of insulin and we also discuss about the pathogenesis of DM and we also look at the risk factors of DM. Then we also toward the end we're going to uh, look at it, the diagnostic and uh, the screening criteria for DM. Uh, maybe next class we are going to discuss about the management. Uh, so uh, remember about insulin is a very important hormone which is synthesized uh, uh, from uh, the beta cells of the pancreas. So it has actually several effects uh, on depending on the, the organ, but mainly on the liver, skeletal, and adipose. The organ, uh, like the effect is very significant. Uh, in the liver, it actually promotes the storage of glucose as a form of glycogen in the liver. Uh, like normally, insulin promotes utilization of glucose. That uh, is actually a very important hormone for the glucose for glucose to be utilized as a source of energy. However, when the glucose level is excess, now it will be actually stored in the form of glycogen. Uh, it should be stored in the form of glycogen in the liver. Uh, but also in skeletal <laughs> insulin stimulates glycogen synthesis and protein synthesis. So still, the insulin promotes excess glucose synthesis in the in the skeletal muscle. And in adipose tissues, it actually even promotes synthesis and prevent uh, degradation of li uh, lipids. So insulin facilitates triglyceride storage by activating uh, uh, like the lipoprotein lipases and etc. So uh, generally speaking. Uh, insulin is actually having anabolic effect in majority of the organ in the liver, skeletal muscle, as well as adipose tissue. So this is how the normal regulation of the blood sugar can be carried out in the system. Remember, after eating, after eating, the blood sugar levels becomes very high. Now the beta cells of the pancreas will secrete insulin in the blood. So as a result, what will happen? There is insulin acts on different target sites like the liver, muscle, and adipose tissues to lower high or excess glucose in the, in the serum. Remember, in the liver, excess can be stored in the form of glycogen. In the muscle, it is stored in the form of glycogen and buildup of protein can be occur. And also in adipose tissue, uh, then the sugar can also be actually deposited in the form of uh, fats. So this is how, how insulin works to reduce the blood sugar level. However, when the blood sugar level is actually very low, now the reverse will happen. Like in between eating, uh, that, is, uh, that is actually a time when we are having some kind of fasting. Uh, the pancreas of the beta cell, uh, sorry, the alpha cells of the pancreas uh, produces glucagon into the blood. So this glucagon has actually several effects to boost the level of sugar in the serum. So in the liver, it actually promotes the breakdown of glycogen to, so that glucose can be produced. And in adipose tissues, even it promotes like the breakdown of fats, and ultimately it increases the sugar level, uh, then it maintains the normal blood sugar level. So this is how uh, the sugar regulation can be uh, carried out like normal blood glucose control can be carried out by insulin and glucagon. But remember, the gluconeogenic hormone, glucagon is not the only hormone that promotes cortisol, even the adrenaline, and even uh, what else? Uh, 
the growth hormone, they are also promoting uh, to increase uh, the level of glucose when it is actually in hypoglycemic state. Okay. Uh, then what will happen if there is a deficiency of insulin? Remember, when there is a deficiency of insulin, the following metabolic regimen can happen. There's an impaired glucose metabolism, impaired lipid metabolism, and impaired protein metabolism are very, are very common. So let's see quickly, because we have mentioned even in the previous session, what is the effect on glucose metabolism? So remember, for the glucose to be utilized by adipose tissue and muscle, they have to be an insulin. So those are insulin-dependent organs. So in case of insulin deficiency, there is an impairment of uh, non-hepatic tissue utilization of glucose. So like the other tissues will not actually utilize glucose as a source of energy. So in particular, uh, in adipose tissue and skeletal muscle, insulin stimulates uptake of glucose. So uh, when there is reduced glucose uptake by the peripheral tissues, it can actually lead us to reduce rate of glucose metabolism and the patient will have hyperglycemia. So in the presence of hyperglycemia, the cells are becoming starved. That is why the polyphagia comes in. Like as a result of the starvation of the cell, because the glucose, despite the glucose is surplus in the serum, it is not utilized because of deficiency of the hormone, insulin. So the cells become starved. So the, the patient will have a frequency or an increased appetite polyphagia. That is why the polyphagia comes in because of starvation of uh, the cell. So when you look at the effect on lipid metabolism, even we mentioned in the previous lesson, insulin stimulates hepatocyte to synthesize triglyceride and the storage of triglyceride in adipose tissue. Remember, triglyceride is actually one form of fat in the body system. So if when a patient is actually having uh, like insulin dependent uh, diabetes, uh, there is rapid mobilization of triglycerides and that leads to increase the level of plasma free fatty acid. So the reverse will happen like the fat undergo hypolysis and there is actually availability of free fatty acid that can be used as an alternative uh, source of energy. So remember, as a result, what will happen, there is increased availability of free fatty acids, then this ultimately exacerbates reduced utilization of glucose, further that increases the risk of hyperglycemia. So uh, this is uh, like uh, when the body is actually utilizing the fat now, they actually ignore the carbohydrate and utilizes uh, glucose as a source of energy. This ultimately actually exacerbates. Uh, the uh, like impaired utilization of glucose by the cell. And ultimately, remember, when there is a continuous lipid degradation, the risk of uh, metabolic acidosis will be uh, very high. We call it in severe condition, we call it diabetic ketoacidosis. We'll discuss it uh, at the end of uh, at the end of normally DM uh, topic. Then uh, this is the major problem. So as a result of degradation of the fat, like some of the fat, they will be converted to uh, ketone bodies. So they will undergo oxidation to be, uh, to be converted to ketone bodies, then it actually causes a risk of uh, ketoacidosis. But remember, uh, those ketone bodies like the acetoacetates, acetoacetate and acetone, they're actually volatile in nature. They can actually even like exhaled by the lung and they do have a uh, fruity odor. Uh, that is why smelling of the breeze is very common. Like they do have fruity breeze uh, when they start producing uh, ketone bodies. So uh, in diabetes, this can be easily diagnosed by smelling the breeze. I think the, the most experienced like endocrinologists, normally they can even make a diagnosis like without testing, they can actually make diagnosis of uh, the production of ketone bodies in the serum by smelling the breeze of a diabetic uh, patient. So that is the end result of uh, like the effect on lipid metabolism. It will end up increasing 
degradation of lipids and ultimately the patient will have high risk of developing ketoacidosis. Uh, so what is the effect of uh, insulin on the protein metabolism? Normally, insulin, insulin has anabolic effect on protein metabolism. However, when the patient is having insulin deficiency, the reverse can happen. Like this ultimately causes catabolism of protein. Catabolism of protein ultimately causes even uh, weight loss, uh, which is very common in type 1 PM. So this is all about, so in summary, when a patient is actually having insulin resistance or insulin deficiency, you will see uh, a, like a range of heterogeneous metabolic derangement on lipid, uh, carbohydrate, uh, and uh, protein metabolism. So having said this much, and uh, now let me take you through now the epidemiology of DM. Remember, the global diabetes, like the global diabetes prevalence in 2019 was estimated to be like 9.3%. That is equivalent to like 463 million people. So like you can actually imagine like in last year, as of last year report, like this number of people, they had a DM globally. So uh, according to the global re report, it will be estimated like this number can raise to uh, 578 million by the year uh, 2030, which is not very, uh, very far. So really uh, the global burden of DM is very high and the prevalence of DM is actually very high uh, like in the, in the developing as well as in developing countries nowadays. So as a result, even it is a major cause of blindness kidney failure, heart attack, stroke, and lower lip amputation. So this is the, those are the complications of hyperglycemia or high sugar level. So remember, because of the osmotic effect of glucose, it can actually cause osmotic damage of the retina and the patient will end up having a loss of vision. Then we have mentioned about the effect of uh, glucose on the kidney. Remember, when glucose binds uh, with glu uh, when glucose binds with uh, a protein, it produces what advanced glycation products. So those are those advanced glycation products are very notorious to cause damage of the proximal renal tubule, and this ultimately causes or the major or number one cause of uh, chronic kidney uh, disease. Then it can also increase heart attack and a stroke and even lower limb amputation. Remember, one of the major complications of uncontrolled sugar is actually gangrene. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result of like what will happen when the sugar is not controlled, it can actually even causes damage of like the blood vessels to the lower extremities. So this ultimately then hardening, stiffening, ultimately causes like depriving or reducing the whole blood to that area and it becomes gangrene and ultimately can undergo necrosis uh, because of deprivation of oxygen and nutrients to the lower extremities. So this is one of the major uh, cause of uh, lower limb amputation is also is by uncontrolled sugar. So, so in, sh in short, monitoring of the DM is very important if you want to increase survival of the patient. Okay, then uh, the prevalence has been rising more rapidly in middle and low income countries. Initially, it was actually uh, like the problem, it was a disease of like developed countries. But nowadays, uh, like because of like sedentary lifestyle, as well as even obesity, nowadays, uh, this is also a problem in uh, developing countries too, especially in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. Then according to WHO estimation, even it can be, it, it was uh, like DM will be, the seventh a leading cause of death in 2030. So this is according to the WHO estimation. And we have mentioned about the prevalence of type 1 and type 2 DM. Type 2 is the most common, which accounts is like up to 90% of all cases. But type 1 is, it accounts for uh, 5 to 10 uh, of all cases of uh, DM. 
So this is the epidemiology of DM according to the global report. Uh, so when you look at the, at the pathophysiology of the end, uh, there are no many information we are going to be discuss under this section because we have mentioned it uh, several times. So uh, the body's main energy source is the metabolism of glucose. I think you have covered in detail, I'm expecting the in biochemistry part. So about the Krebs cycle, glycolysis and the tea. Those are very important areas you are supposed to read even for stage one exam in PPB. Uh, so the cells metabolize glucose completely through glycolysis in the Krebs cycle. And the ultimate end product of Krebs cycle is water and carbon dioxide. Of course, it can generate around like 36 to 38 gigs of ATP. Uh, so glucose is not immediately needed for energy. It is stored in the liver and the muscle as a form of glycogen. As I mentioned before, insulin promotes utilization, but when it is excess, it is actually stored in the liver and muscle in the form of glycogen. That is, that is one role of insulin. So later, when the energy is needed, you can actually even imagine how we are created as a human being. Like the body system is actually even develop a backup system. The, the, like the body normally develop a backup system of energy in case of, in case of any need. But even us, we don't even bother about exam. We don't even like uh, prepare like a power backup. That's why we are receiving so many complaints during exam. Like power is goes or my internet was not working. So, so many issues. So uh, later when energy is needed, what will happen now the glycogenolysis process will actually convert the stored glycogen to glucose so that the cell can utilize the glucose by undergoing glycolysis and, and the end products of glycolysis like the pyruvate goes to the Krebs cycle and ultimately produces ATP in the form of NADPH and NADH. Okay, anyway, this one you have to revise it, especially uh, towards like the beginning of like the board exam. You have to revise about the glucose metabolism, the Krebs cycle. Those are like the most common uh, question I have I've seen from the sample paper. Okay, then uh, when uh, excess glucose also can be converted to triglycerides and stored in fat tissues, that is how insulin works on the lipid metabolism. So excess sugar in the adipose tissue can store actually in the form of glycolysis, sorry, triglycerides, and they stored in the fat. So when they are needed, then it will uh, go back to, uh, to glucose. Then glycolysis and Krebs cycle to be utilized as a form of energy. So uh, you can actually even imagine insulin and glucagons are the one which is actually like controlling uh, the sugar metabolism in the body system. And the beta cells usually make up like 70 to 90 percent of the isolators and produces insulin. So you can actually even imagine, like majority of the pancreas is like the beta cell, which are, is responsible to produce insulin. So we have mentioned about the role of insulin and other counter regulatory hormones. Glucagon and other counter regulatory hormones are very very important to increase the sugar level. Yes. Then, uh, what will happen when there is actually like a derangement in the function of the beta cell? Now, that is the problem coming in. So mostly, at the time of diagnosis, most patients have a 90% loss of beta cell function. So, especially in type 1 DM, at the time of diagnosis, around like 90% or most of the beta cell functions are actually lost. So the remaining, what will happen? The remaining, the remaining 10% of the beta cell function at the diagnosis creates like a honeymoon period. So in the like in the context of like uh, this class, honeymoon period means like this is a period whereby the blood, the blood glucose control can be easier with a smaller amount of insulin. So like at the time of diagnosis, 
there are some, some amount of the bits are cell which is actually which is actually functional which are actually functional uh, so that it is easier to control okay so the problem will be when this the remaining beta cell function is lost like 10 percent now the patient becomes completely insulin deficient and require more exogenous insulin so that is why there is a scenario whereby when the patient starts insulin like a small dose of insulin is we are able to control the sugar but later in the life we are actually like the patient is not responding with the same dose that means it is referring or or that it will tell us like this uncontrolled uh, uh, sugar is not really due to like uh, like resistance of the target organ to the action of insulin rather the remaining beta cell function is already like already gone so we are supposed to actually give like extra high dose of insulin as compared to the initial the initial doses so this one is like a common a common uh, issues you will see in the practical setting in type 1 dm uh, patient okay uh, during the period of fasting uh, like uh, most circulating glucose is produced by the liver so like liver is really very important huh? like even it actually protects us from hypoglycemia during the period of fasting so we need to maintain our liver healthy as much as we can by avoiding at least drinking of alcohol okay uh, so this endogenous production of glucose services to ensure uh, the brain is a constant supply of glucose remember in the previous lesson we have mentioned like the kidney the eye and the brain they are actually like utilizing glucose independent of insulin so what matters what matters about the supply is the availability of endogenous insulin in the serum if the serum is actually having low level of sugar like the first organ that is affected by hypoglycemia is the brain tissue but remember that is why constant supply of glucose is very important and if a patient is actually having hyperglycemia the risk of disease is higher as compared to uh, hyperglycemia hyperglycemia is by the way is not really an emergency unless the patient develops like uh, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis but hypoglycemia is a medical emergency the moment the brain tissue is not getting glucose means now the brain tissue starts to dying now this ultimately actually causes the death immediately that is why hypoglycemia is a medical emergency it can kill the patient as soon as possible uh, because of uh, depriving of energy to the brain tissues uh, so insulin secretion during fasting is generally low i think this one is self explanatory because in the fasting state we don't have sufficient level of glucose so insulin level is supposed to be low but on the other hand the other counter regulatory hormone level will be usually uh, high so on eating what will happen the blood glucose level rises and the insulin secretion response occur in two two phases remember when the patient when when we are eating food like the the modality of insulin secretion is carried out in two phases the first one is we call it like the breast or bolus insulin secretion within 10 minutes after ingestion of uh, uh, glucose so we call it the first phase insulin response so an initial breast which lasts for 10 minutes and it usually serves to suppress the hepatic glucose production so this usually minimizes this bolus of insulin usually minimizes hyperglycemia during meals and during postprandial period so the moment we eat there is actually initial burst of insulin which is pr produced by the beta cells of the pancreas that is why we'll discuss later when during the management to mimic this endogenous production that is why we give like uh, some insulin production should be given like 15 minutes before food other should be 30 minutes before food 
especially regular insulin, which is commonly available in the market, is usually given like 30 minutes before meal, so that it can mimic like uh, to control postprandial hyperglycemia. However, the loss of this first phase insulin response is an ill even in the progression from glucose intolerance to deinsulation. So, however, when a patient is actually having uh, a problem in the beta cells of the pancreas, remember this phase first phase response will be reduced, and that's why we are supposed to give exogenous insulin. Then the second phase of insulin response is characterized by a gradual increase in insulin secretion, a gradual increase in insulin secretion, which stimulates glucose uptake by the peripheral insulin-dependent tissues. So the second phase is usually a gradual release insulin, which usually promotes a utilization of glucose by the peripheral tissues. So this one, or the slow release of insulin, allows the body to respond the new glucose from the digestion while maintaining the blood glucose level. So those are the two phases of insulin secretion. So uh, in cases of type 2 DM, there is a possibility we can see the level of insulin becomes very high endogenously, hyperinsulinemia or high blood level of insulin. So this is very common finding in the development of type 2 DM because as a result of insulin resistance, like the body, like the body tries to produce more insulin, more insulin. That is why uh, this is very common, uh, common finding to maintain the blood sugar level. But mostly, when a patient is having type two DM, at uh, the diagnosis, like forty percent of the beta cell function is normal. So that is why uh, we start to have forty percent beta cell function at the diagnosis. So. 40% uh, of the beta cell function is actually normal. That is why uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is very likely uh, when a patient is having uh, type 2 DM because the remaining beta cells of the pancreas prevent degradation of lipids and the production of ultimately the production of uh, uh, ketone bodies. So as DM progresses, remember, even in type 2 DM, large number of patients with type 2 DM eventually loses all beta cell function and require exogenous insulin to maintain the blood glucose level. So this is the scenario where we are going to use even insulin in type 2 DM. So I will discuss in detail when we are discussing about the management, but this is mostly due to when the beta cell function is actually going down or a dosis, then the patient ultimately becomes dependent on insulin. And sometimes we're supposed to add insulin. Exogenous administration is uh, mandatory in these circumstances, but I will explain later. Then the other uh, parameter that should come to the pathophysiology of this condition is insulin resistance. Remember, insulin resistance may be present up to 10 years prior to the diagnosis of DM. This is why type 2 DM is really a very unknown and most of the patients are asymptomatic until there is like a significant derangement in the beta cell function. So like and can continue to progress throughout the course of the disease. And mostly it occurs significantly in the skeletal muscle and the liver. So those are the major organs uh, they actually uh, important uh, to depend on uh, insulin to work, especially to regulate the sugar level, they have to depend on insulin. So uh, liver become then responsive to insulin for glucose uptake and the hepatic production of glucose during the feed state does not cease. In principle, when we're eating, uh, like hepatic production is supposed to cease because we are actually taking, we are replacing glucose. But in case of resistance, like 
because like there is like the target organs are not responding so the body really do not know like so the body perceives like they're supposed to produce they're supposed to actually uh, produce more glucose by even hepatic uh, uh, glycogenolysis so this is because of resistance then remember something about insulin. Insulin is a free monomer. Uh, the half-life of insulin is like very short, three to five minutes. But if you inadvertently administer insulin for a long patient, the patient will end up hypoglycemic shock. That is why insulin can cause perfect death. Okay, uh, then uh, apart from that, uh, the primary metabolism of insulin is by the liver and the kidney, especially when we are giving subcutaneous administration of insulin, kidney is the principal organ uh, that can eliminate uh, insulin from the from the system, from the system. So this is the principal organ. So you can actually even imagine when a patient is having hepatic and renal disease, uh, there is a reduction in the rate of insulin clearance. So those adjustment is usually mandatory. But then if a patient is having maybe type 1 DM uh, with renal problem, now you have to adjust the dose of uh, insulin. Otherwise, otherwise uh, the patient will end up having side effect of insulin, which is mostly hypoglycemia, which is very dangerous. So that is why as a pharmacist, what we are supposed to know especially dose adjustment is very, very important and which is very, uh, very key, especially for insulin, because the patient can end up having hypoglycemic uh, uh, shock. Okay, so dose adjustment is important in this condition. So this is all uh, in summary about the pathogenesis of this condition. So like in summary, uh, when a patient is having DM, then it usually starts like uh, <clears throat> like uh, decrease the responsiveness of phase one and phase two secretion and even insulin resistance and ultimately the clinical feature will come in. So now let's see about the etiology of DM. What really causes like uh, this full functioning of the beta cells of the pancreas? So in type one, as we mentioned in the previous class. The major problem in type 1 DM is a resistance, sorry, autoimmune destruction. So uh, this one is mostly due to autoimmune uh, destruction, but this autoimmune destruction can be triggered by environmental factors such as viruses and toxin and in genetically susceptible uh, individual. So viral infection, some kind of toxin can actually even cause destruction. I think I mentioned a toxin. Like, do you remember like what kind of medication we are going to use to induce, uh, or what kind of chemical are we going to use to induce DM uh, in in mice model or in animal model? Is there anyone who can recall? Anyone? Streptozotocin. Yes, yes. Good. Streptozotocin uh, and aloxan, especially streptozotocins are very important. It can cause like permanent destruction of the beta cell, but aloxan usually reverses that. I don't think so. We have those chemical uh, in our lab. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Mm. But uh, have you like started anti diabetic medication in pharmacology? Have you started or not yet? We've started. Oh, you have started, huh? Okay, good. So I think it will be very easier like to capture if you have already started anti-diabetic medication, which is good. Huh? Okay, then, uh, but mostly the cause of this autoimmune destruction is idiopathic, like no one really knows. So like in type 1 DM, we can see it is an autoimmune destruction of the beta cell, but no one knows 
what really causes this autoimmune destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas. But according to like the latest evidence I have, some kind of viral infection toxin can actually cause destruction and ultimately uh, the patient will end up having type 1 DM. So uh, when you come to type 2 DM, there are several risk factors. The one and the most uh, well known is obesity, overweight. Huh? I think this one, you have to actually like give, like if you want to live longer life, do exercise regularly. And if you want to live longer life, control your diet. Huh? Don't actually like eat too much, especially those fatty foods like meat and the tea. So regulate or balance your diet. That is very important. Huh? Otherwise, especially like in type 2 DM, overweight is like one of the major causes of type 2 DM. And even when someone is actually overweight, the American Diabetic Association recommendation is mostly there is a need of like regular and frequent screening for DM if someone is actually overweight. So you have to think about yourself. Am I now in the normal body mass index? If not, what am I going to do? Am I going to start like a regular aerobic exercise? So the recommendation, by the way, is like 30 minutes aerobic exercise, like five days in a week. If you can, like seven days in a week is usually recommended for healthy life. That is like, I think I have seen this information from where, I think from American Diabetic Association about uh, like uh, treatment of DM. You can actually even read the guideline, it is free. Yeah, and you can read the latest guideline, maybe if it is available. I think the latest I have is 2019. Over, overweight is the major risk factor which can cause insulin resistance. Then family history of DM is very important. That is why if you do have a family history of DM, even uh, like early screening is usually recommended for type 2 DM. Then ethnic predisposition, it says according to this, uh, it is very common with African-American, Latino, Native American, Asian, and Pacific Island descent, so those kind of like uh, race, uh, the Asian race, African American race are highly susceptible for type 2 DM. But this one is not an exception even for Africa because the prevalence of DM in African population is, is actually rising rapidly because of sedimentary way uh, lifestyle. Then prevails impaired fasting glucose level. If you remember, like if the sugar level is between 100 uh, to 125, we call it impaired. So if a patient is having, like if someone is having that one, that is, we call it pre-diabetes. So we don't initiate treatment at this stage, but they are supposed to do regular exercise. Dietary modification is very, very important, but this is a risk factor. Uh, then uh, maybe uh, other condition is like hypertension, and even dyslipidemia and other cardiovascular diseases are uh, some of the risk factors that can increase uh, the risk of uh, type 2 DM. So those are some of the risks. I think you can read more uh, later uh, for type 2 DM, but the leading type or the leading cause of type 2 DM is obesity. So you have to work on obesity if you are overweight and obese. So having said this much, uh, now let us discuss about the clinical features. What are the clinical manifestations of uh, high sugar or hyperglycemia due to insulin resistance or insulin deficiency? So generally speaking, like symptomatically, type 1 and type 2 DM are similar. There, there is no much difference in terms of septum, but the difference is the intensity of the symptoms are different. That is the major difference. And apart from that, uh, type 1 DM are more severe and faster in onset. So like uh, the onset of presentation is very fast for type 1, but type 2 is usually very, very gradual because we do have a remaining uh, beta cell, which is functional. Okay, so uh, the symptoms are mostly related to 
the osmotic effect of glucose and the abnormality of energy partitioning. Remember, glucose has osmotic effect. So wh what will happen when the glucose level is actually very high in the serum? So it actually draws water. Like the water flow will actually from the cell to the, to the, to the extracellular environment. So intracellular dehydration is actually very common. So when you do have actually like that water flow, it actually even promote polyuria because it actually draws water from the cell to the extracellular fluid that is plasma, then ultimately like there is actually leakage or excessive loss of uh, water in the form of urine. This ultimately even causes dehydration. But they, what kills the patient in diabetic ketoacidosis is the dehydration. That is why fluid replacement is like the front line in the management when you are managing a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis. But I will come later to that point. So what are the clinical manifestations of uh, DM in general? Polyuria. So why polyuria? This polyuria is because of the osmotic effect of glucose. So increased urine production, mostly noticeable at night time. I don't know how many of you came across a diabetic patient. Maybe what is your experience? You know, some, some of you might be actually, you have like your grandmom, grandmother, or father, mother, uh, like having DM. Yeah, this is very common condition. So how is your experience so far about this patient or about this disease? Anyone who is willing to share us the experience, you had it before in case if you have. Any? Okay. Uh, so uh, we have mentioned about polyuria is due to the osmotic effect of sugar. And there is also a lot of fatigue. Remember, the fatigue is mostly due to their inability to utilize glucose. The cells are actually very starved uh, because of they are not able to use glucose as a source of energy. Then market weight loss, which is very common, specifically in type 1 DM, uh, is very common due to the degradation of protein and fats as an alternative source of energy. As an alternative source of energy. Then we have mentioned about the blood vision uh, is mostly because of the osmotic effect of glucose in the eye. It can cause uh, damage of the retina. Then, and ultimately, it is actually one of the major cause of blindness. If the sugar is not controlled properly, then the patient will eat a, a loss of vision. That is why, as part of the screening, like as part of the monitoring, visual examination is usually recommended when a patient is having ADM. Polyphagia, as I mentioned before, like the cells are not utilizing the glucose properly. So, they actually, that compensatory response is polyphagia. They do have an intention to eat too much. So maybe you can actually look up your experience uh, in the future, uh, like how, how they are eating. Is that really true? Do they have polyphagia? You will tell, you will get a lot of information when you are approaching uh, those patients. So in summary, what is the clear difference between type one and type two DM? So uh, type one is insulin dependent, type two is insulin dependent. Age of onset type one is usually less than 30 years. Type two is usually above 40 years. Pancreatic function, usually there is none, but this one is low, normal, or high amount. Pathogenesis associated with autoimmune condition, this one, but this one is mostly due to resistance. A possibility of inheritance, type 1 is not very strong, but type 2 is very, uh, very strong. Obesity is very, very common, like in 60 to 90% of the patients of type 2 DM. And this one is 
mostly they are very lean. And histoketoacidosis often present in type 1, but in type 2 is very rare, except in severe or few circumstances. Huh? OK, clinical presentation, moderate to severe septum. Uh, that generally progress relatively rapidly, like days to weeks. But this one is uh, mostly uh, mild. Huh? And as I mentioned before, they are diagnosed mostly when the patient has gone for other an investigation for other investigation. So this is all about the clinical features of uh, the um, uh, patients in general. So now uh, let's talk about the screening recommendations according to the uh, Diabetic Association. But hey, this is like the most common guideline that is utilized by the endocrinologist, like those DM specialists. So that is why uh, we are supposed to read. Like most of the information even from the local guideline, I don't think so we have a local guideline which is specifically talking about DM, but most of them are derived from the American Diabetes Association. So according to that association, we do an adult patient is supposed to undergo a screen. According to the recommendation, like according to the 2019, Delay, uh, a patient or an adult is supposed to undergo a screening every year, three years, starting at the age of 45 years. So, like before that, very likely, uh, like to diagnose for type 2 DM, but before that, mostly we expect type 1 DM. And even for type 1 DM, uh, mostly it's not recommended because like the, the possibility of developing the septums are very rapid. So it will capture like because of the clinical presentation, but this one is mostly asymptomatic. However, if a patient is actually having risk factor such as obesity, regardless of the age, they are supposed to undergo frequent screening. But they did mention how frequent they're supposed to undergo screening but more frequent screening is generally recommended. That is the recommendation from American Diabetic Association in terms of screening. But for asymptomatic type 1 DM, the ADA does not recommend screening for type 1 DM because low incidence in the general population and due to an acute presentation of the symptom. Like the prevalence is very low. And apart from that, like the condition is usually very acute. So it will be captured because of the presentation. So uh, for type 1 DM, the American Diabetic Association does not recommend the screening. And then what about for gestational DM? So a screening for undiagnosed type 2 DM, first prenatal visit in those with risk factor are uh, using standard criteria is usually recommended. But nowadays, by the way, when a patient, when a mother is going for antenatal care, uh, they are going to check even the possibility of uh, gestational DM. And we mentioned about why gestational DM is very common and why it happens, why it happens in, in few mothers. I mentioned the reason uh, in the previous class. So the recommendation, all women should be screened within uh, oral glucose tolerance test between week 24 and 28 of gestation. This is the time most likely uh, the mother uh, will have uh, the possibility of having uh, gestational DM or hyperglycemia. So this is a recommendation according to the uh, American uh, Diabetic Association guideline. So uh, what are the diagnostic criteria? Now, after screening, let us see about the diagnostic criteria of American Diabetic Association, even WHO, they are actually having the same diagnostic criteria. So the current ADA diagnostic criteria uh, is this one. The patient is supposed to be symptomatic of DM, like the polyseptum, polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. Plus, a casual plasma glucose concentration. Remember, casual plasma glucose concentration means uh, 
random blood sugar level. For example, regardless of the timing of the meal, if I take the blood sample, we call it random blood sugar level. So casual is defined as any time of the day without regard to time since the last meal. Okay, so if the blood sugar level of random blood sugar RBS, we call it RBS, is above or equal to 200 or 11.1 millimole per liter with symptoms of DM, such as polyuria, polydipsia, and unexplained weight loss. Now the patient is classified as a diabetic patient. Or a fasted blood sugar level like fasting, as I mentioned before, no calorie intake for at least eight hours. Like before that, by the way, if we measure the sugar level before that, it can cause a misleading result. So the, the patient is supposed to be deprived from uh, calorie or any food for a minimum of eight hours. So if the fasting sugar level above or equal to 26 or seven millimole per liter, we can say, with septum, remember still with the septum, we call it the patient is still having uh, a DM or a two hour post lower glucose, we call it oral glucose tolerance test. We load either 75 or 100. I think the current guideline is mostly use 75 gram of uh, glucose. I, I don't know about the practice in India. I think they usually give them soda. They just give them soda, then two hours later, uh, they usually like uh, measure the sugar level. But okay, okay, soda has a lot of sugar, but it's not the standard recommendation. But that is what I have seen uh, from some areas. Like they give them soda, then you measure the sugar level two hours later. But anyways, the cut off point for a random blood sugar level and uh, all OGTT is the same. Uh, it is should be above or equal to 200 and or 11.1 millimole per liter. So we call it the patient is having, the patient is having DM or currently even glycated hemoglobin is also part of the diagnostic criteria. I think it was not there before. Like it is hemoglobin greater than or equal to 6.5%. It is usually reported in percent. So we call it the patient is having DM. So we have seen like it is hemoglobin, random blood sugar level, fasting, or oral glucose tolerance test. Those are the current standards in the diagnosis of DM. So whichever applies for us, Depending on availability of the material, we can do either RBS, fasting, uh, then OGTT, or uh, or glycated hemoglobin can be can be used. But remember, glycated hemoglobin uh, percentage will tell us like in the past weeks or months, uh, like a maximum of three months uh, control. It will tell us like what was the sugar in the past? But the random fasting and OGTT will tell us what is the current sugar level of the patient. So you have to know the difference. Okay, this is how a diagnosis can be made for uh, adults. Mm -hmm. However, uh, for, for gestational DM patients, the diagnosis is slightly different than how are they going to screen or test uh, for a gestational DM? So it is a bit different. So there are two possible strategies and even ADA recommends use either strategies, whichever easier to you. You can either use one step uh, or two step process. So one step means you just actually give them 75 gram OGTT then you measure the sugar level at an hour and two hours later, then you, you look at the result. The two-step process is usually involves a one hour, uh, 50 gram then fasting the screening. You give them like 50 gram of glucose first. Then after that, <clears throat> if the blood sugar level 
is actually above uh, like when 40 milligrams per deciliter, you are going to give like, uh, you are going to give 100 gram OGT test and you measure every an hour, like for three hours. So this is a two step process because we measure like uh, the sugar level after we give uh, 50 gram. Then after that, we are going to do another test like by giving 100 gram of glucose. That is why this is a two step process. Huh? I think the one step process is a bit easier. So uh, the, the principle in case of OGTT is you fast the patient overnight fast. Then the moment they come in the morning for the test, you give them 75 gram glucose. Then after you give 75 gram glucose, then the patient stay for two hours, then you measure the sugar level. So the moment they come in the morning, you measure like that is the fasting sugar level. And then after you load that, after you take the blood sample for fasting, then you give sugar, then you measure at our one hour and two hours. So if any of the parameter is actually meet or exceeded, we can say the patient is having gestational DM. Either fasting of 5.1, but please note the difference. In case of fasting blood sugar level, we have said the sugar level should be above seven millimole for normal individual, like for non-pregnant woman. However, for pregnant woman, the fasting sugar level is usually low, the cut point point. If it is above 5.1, we can say the patient is having gestational DM. And I will come later why the fasting sugar level is low in gestational DM. Okay, so one hour. So if any of the three is actually meet or above the, the cut point, we can say the patient is actually having gestational DM. The two-step process, as I mentioned before, is uh, the, the fasting, then one hour, two hours, and three hours. So it, if two or more of the following cut points are actually meet or exceeded, we can say the patient is actually having gestational DM. So why the cut point? Why the cut point? The cut point. Uh, the cut uh, of point, sorry, the cut of point is very low in pregnant ladies, alike, alike other individual. So what will happen? Remember, the normal fasting levels are lower in pregnancy due to constant siphoning of fetal siphoning of glucose and gluconeogenic amino acids. Remember, when a mother is actually pregnant, there is a constant supply of glucose to the mother, to, to the child, to the to the mother, sorry, to the fetus. Because of that reason, the fasting blood sugar level is, or the cut of the cut off point for uh, fasting sugar level in pregnant mother is usually lower. It should not be above seven. It should be above five point one millimole per per liter. Uh, however, however, the post glucose levels are usually lower as compared to the fat because after you load glucose, they are anti insulinic effect of human placental lactogen and other anti insulin hormone, which is produced by the placenta. That is why the post load glucose level is a bit higher as compared to the fasting, the fasting one, but still. They are not the same like the top, the other uh, individual. So this is the difference uh, between the two. So in short, the cut of point for uh, pregnant ladies is different when we are screening for gestational DM. For gestational DM, it is totally uh, different. I think that is uh, the whole point. So any questions so far? Any questions? 
Okay, fine. Now, in the next few minutes, we are going to see, uh, we are going to see like a simple case studies. So uh, I'm expecting you like an active participation is actually very, uh, very, very important. So I don't think so there is a sense of like breakout session for this uh, discussion. So maybe, yeah, you look at the question individually, then we shall see it together. I give you like one minute to see the question, one minute for this slide. Okay, uh, so now I am back. Huh? So what is your observation about like uh, from the this simple case studies, what information is suggested of diabetes, what criteria must be met before a diagnosis can be made, what type of DM do you think MEF has based on these clinical parameters? So what is your opinion? So let me call randomly. Some people might not be even available. Okay, uh, uh, Angela. Yes. So what what do you think from the case studies? Huh? Did you manage to go through all the slides? Yes. Okay. So. Okay. Uh -huh. Um. Okay, um, the first question was, what is suggestive that he has um, diabetes? Yes. Um, I think um, in, the, in the labs, yes? Ah, yeah, in the slide for the labs, we are seeing the fasting glucose is 10.9, 10.49, and we know mm -hmm. that it should be seven, seven millimoles per liter. Yes. So uh, the fasting sugar level is like very high, which is a cut point for the diabetes. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay, good. Any other? Um, can you say his oh, his BMI also is high? Mm -hmm. If you calculate. Yeah, yes. If you calculate. It was coming. Mm -hmm. What was the BMI? I just a minute. I just 
Sorry, how much? Like BMI, is, how do you calculate body mass index? Weight is weight of um, yeah, height, but in I'm centimeter. Sure. Height in centimeter, but it should be in uh, in meter, yes? Height in meter square. Yes. Okay, good. So like even by the, without doing the calculation, you can actually even estimate this one is most likely like uh, a risk, uh, like overweight, uh, uh, overweight. We can say even without calculation, most likely this is overweight when you look at the height. Uh. Mm. Okay, good. Any other parameters? So what criteria must be met or what information are suggested? She mentioned one. Do we have any other parameters that can suggest the patient will have DM apart from the body mass index and the fasting glucose level? What about the blood urea nitrogen creatinine? Seems like they are within the normal range. Yeah? Liver function test, LT and ST within the normal range. Thyroid stimulating hormone uh, is still within the normal range. Total cholesterol, it is above 200, by the way. Yeah? If LDL uh, above 100 and total cholesterol above 200 is like, uh, the patient is most likely having like uh, high level of cholesterol, which is a risk factor, which might be associated with like the obesity. Triglyceride level even is still high. Hemoglobin A1C, I don't know whether you have, you have noted this one. Those are the key. Hemoglobin A1C is also high, yes? It is above 6.5%. So we have noted like there's a derangement in the cholesterol level. HDL level is actually like, uh, is very low. Like any HDL less than 40 or less than 50 is a risk factor. LDL above 100 is also a risk factor. So like uh, what information suggests if the patient is having DM, uh, most likely the derangement, the cholesterol level, the hemoglobin A1C, the fasting blood sugar level, and even the BP is hypertensive. Huh? Those are actually increase uh, the risk factor. Okay, what criteria must be met before a diagnosis of DM can be made? What criteria should be met? Met. Okay. Patel. Patel, are you there or you're not available? Okay, Anit. Um, you can do what is it called? You can do fasting blood glucose levels test. Mm -hmm. You can do OGTT. Mm -hmm. You can do HbA1c. Mm -hmm. You can do. Uh, yeah, those are the, the those are the diagnosis criteria you can do or you can do yeah those three I think you can do when by alone they're not sufficient but with the full septum we can actually consider those criteria must meet. So what type of DM do you think MF has based on his clinical features? Uh, now this one will go to Feven. Um, I think he has type 2. Okay, why? Um, because of the signs such as obesity and all this. Yeah. Yes, like because of obesity and look at even ages. Okay, it is above 30 and type 1 is usually common below 30 years. Uh, okay, but most likely because of obesity and there is no any autoimmune markers. Uh, you can actually even look at the thyroid function test is normal. So there is no like autoimmune marker. So most likely uh, the patient will have actually like uh, type one, type two DM. Uh, 
uh, because of his weight. Huh? Okay, now uh, this is another question. Huh? So uh, go through it for like uh, for two minutes. I think how many slides here? Two slides. Okay, I'm back. So what is your opinion about this patient? Let me ask Faith Okello. Faith? Okay, then Geoffrey? Kate, Kate Mumbo. Yes. Yeah, so what do you, what is your opinion? Uh, uh, uh this one. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Um, the risk factors would be because um she used to smoke. Mm -hmm. and, um, and tobacco increases uh, the risk of insulin resistance. Okay, good. Yes, just to smoke. Okay, good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Any other relief? And the family history. Uh -huh. uh, the fact that the, the father and no, actually the mother had uh, had diabetes. Um, she was prone to getting diabetes too. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So, like based on your observation, what are the risk factor? Like, did smoking? What are the possible risk factor the patient will have? So, for this woman, mm -hmm. um, family history um, yeah. of diabetes, okay, huh? and the fact that she was more than thirty-five years. Mm -hmm. And then um, pre diabetes, previous deliveries of babies um, with high birth weight, mm -hmm. and then um, smoking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. So those are the possible uh, risk factor. So this is a, a kind of gestational uh, DM. Like if you see the case, a 42 years old African American woman. Uh, present to her physician for a follow-up appointment for her uh, recent uh, pregnancy. Uh, upon questioning, she said that she was diagnosed with gestational DM during the pregnancy before. 
So this is uh, like a history, uh, one possible risk factor, if you remember. Uh, then the two of her previous three children weighed greater than uh, four kg at birth. Even this one actually increases. Uh, remember, macrosomia is actually one risk factor. So most likely the weight is having four kg is actually because of her previous gestational year. Then she's currently 12 weeks postpartum and without uh, complaint. Uh, so when you look at the possible risk factor, family history is very important here. The smoking by the way increases DM, which is uh, kind of 12 increase. Uh, even it could be her medication, but uh, uh, she's taking a steroid, fluticasso nasal uh, spray, one each spray each nostril. I think most likely she has uh, taken for allergic rhinitis. Uh, uh, I'm thinking because were there any other significant uh, medical history uh, that leads to the use of uh, fluticasone spray? I am thinking it is for allergic rhinitis. Huh? So the vital signs seems like normal. Okay, 75 kg. You can even calculate her body mass index. Uh, radio system, there is a positive for fatigue. She was actually complaining fatigue, okay, which is also one presentation. Uh, then nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, no headache, uh, no uh, shortness of breeze and chest pain. Okay, positive for fatigue, nausea and vomiting negative, headache, shortness of breeze and chest pain. I don't know how we are going to uh, see uh, this finding. It is like they have shortness of breeze. Okay, we can assume they are having shortness of breeze and chest pain and uh, headache, yes. Then uh, the possible risk factors are the one uh, we mentioned before. Then which type of DM do her characteristics suggest? Most likely it is gestational DM because uh, this, uh, like the show, our, those features are uh, actually present uh, during the time of uh, pregnancy. Then what additional information is needed to diagnose uh, this patient with DM? So what additional information do we need? What additional information do we need from her? to diagnose fasting blood sugar. Yes, yeah. the OGTT result and the fasting sugar level should be obtained to make the diagnosis. But clinically, the patient is highly suggestive of gestational DM, but we need to get those results to make a conclusive diagnosis, uh, a conclusive diagnosis of uh, gestational DM. Question. Yes, question. Um, but she came like 12 weeks postpartum. Mm -hmm. Is she still, but and she, uh, why is it still gestational yet? She's not pregnant. Okay, it is a good question, by the way. Like she actually came uh, for actual weeks uh, postpartum and uh, without uh, complaint. Okay, uh, it can actually by the happen. Remember, uh, it depends on like how the screening can be done. Like we don't have sufficient information with the patient might be asymptomatic and she, she did not undergo the screening during her gestation, but later on, it can be detected or remember what we have mentioned in the previous session, uh, gestational DM can be resolved after delivery, but it will, it will take some time to resolve. So within this period, the probability of detection is actually very high. So like it seems like the patient, we don't have sufficient information uh, whether the patient is actually has been checked before, but uh, the information is she is currently 12 weeks of postpartum. So uh, like it can be resolved or it can be persistent. It can be resolved or it can be persistent. So. Uh, because of that reason, uh, most likely uh, the patient was having gestational DM, but uh, that condition was not resolved after uh, delivery yet. So we will say it's still gestational, uh, but uh, depending on the information, it is not sufficient to say. Yeah, it is not uh, sufficient to say, and we need to get like further information whether uh, the patient is actually 
uh, having any any documentation of sugar level uh, uh, during the gestation period. But most likely, it suggests uh, this is highly indicator. So gestational DM. Why? Because family history we can see, and we have said even she was actually having a previous history of gestational DM and ETC. So most likely, it can suggest a gestational DM, but we still need to get more information to confirm uh, the diagnosis. Okay, any other questions so far? Any other question? Question? Yes. At what time would a doctor request a random blood sugar? I'm sorry? At what time will a doctor request for random blood sugar? At what time means like uh, they will ask normally like have you taken like there is no specific time by the for random sugar, but when you say random, it is usually like after taking food, regardless of the time, but it should be after taking food. So there is no specific timing, but mostly by the because it can it can give you a misleading result. You know, if you measure like, like for example, I take my breakfast now and they measure like the sugar level, maybe after 10 minutes, huh? then or maybe in for other patients, they will take normally the sugar level after maybe like how many minutes after five hours. Huh? It is not really concrete result. Huh? There might be a variation in the result. Because of that reason, fasting is best. You take fasting, blood sugar level. But in case, if the patient is actually admitted in the emergency and you are sure uh, the patient has already taken you have to take the sugar level uh, that is ran still random, but there is no specific time frame for random, but it is after taking food, regardless of the time of the meal. That is when we call it random. But as I said before, there might be a slight variation depending on the duration of the meal. Yeah, otherwise there is no specific time. But I think uh, fasting is best. It actually minimizes that variation. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Yeah, there is no time frame for uh, for random. Okay, good. Okay. Any other question? Thank you. Any other? Okay, good. Okay, in fact, uh, maybe next time, can you try to join like exactly maybe around nine, five, nine, ten? Don't go beyond that because I have seen some people are actually even joining like towards the end of the session. Uh, because of this reason, it is very hard like to progress eh? uh, as, I, as we are supposed to progress. Eh? So please, 